All right, so if you're visiting with us, uh, or maybe you've been gone for a while, we are marching through the Gospel of Luke, and we've been in this for a while. We're in chapter 11, and uh, we are actually on our fifth week of looking just at the first four verses of chapter 11, which is the Lord's Prayer, as recorded by Luke. Now, you'll notice that uh, Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew's is a little bit different, and uh, you'll want to kind of think about all of the words of the Lord's Prayer. Each one is very intentional, very thoughtful. And so you can go back to our website and view those messages or download the PDF to try to get caught up where we are. We hope that you will because this is a very, very important turning point really in in Luke's gospel. What you'll see is that as Jesus teaches us to pray, it's going to set a template for everything he's going to teach on in the many, many parables that follow after after this prayer. And so this is at the very heart of our identity and, and what Jesus told us. Here's what pleases the Father. Pray this way. Last week we looked at Thy kingdom come, and how that is at the very heart of the New Testament worldview of the kingdom of God coming and taking precedence over our little kingdom, his agenda, trumping our agenda, and so on. Today, we're going to move into the next line, which is most commonly uh, interpreted in the English language as, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Now, I'm going to ask your permission, and and I don't want you to check out. I, I want to talk about the Greek a little bit with you. Now, some of you are like, good, I needed a nap. Don't, don't take a nap. This is really, this is good, and I, it's relevant, all right? Okay, let me tell you why. If you read this from left to right in the original Greek manuscripts that we have, it would, it would be our bread, and then there would be a descriptor, epiousion, and then give it to us daily. Our bread, epiousion, give it to us daily. Epiousion is a descriptor for the bread, our bread, Right? Now, this word epiousion is found nowhere else in any Greek literature that anyone can find. Now, that's interesting, right? That was worth the price of admission. That wasn't so painful. (laughs) Epiousion is not found in any place else. It's only found in the Bible, only in the New Testament, and only in the Lord's Prayer in Luke and Matthew. And so, you know, this has caused Greek scholars and, and biblical scholars something to scratch their head about for a long time. And so what can we conclude? We conclude that Jesus made up a word, Or that he said something, you know, within the Aramaic, which would be the common language of his day, that when Matthew and Luke tried to write it down in the Greek, there just wasn't a Greek word for that. And so they made one up. They used the common preposition epi, and then they put another word next to it, and that created epiousion. So what is it, the other word, right? There's three different words that it could possibly be. And so I'll just share that with you. Uh, The first one, the one that the great Greek scholar Origen and one of the early church fathers kind of said is that he believed it was epiousia, and that would be uh, kind of the, the essence of necessary for our existence. So you'd read left to right, our bread, necessary for existence, give it to us daily. Then there were some you know, other theories of epiinai, E-I-N-A-I, in case you want to write that down. <laughs> and, and it would be uh, just daily. So you know, it would read, our daily bread, give it to us daily. And that's really the way that most English translations interpret this mysterious word. And it sounds a little bit redundant, doesn't it, when we say that? Have you ever thought about that? Give us this day our daily bread. We, it's, it's a little redundant, but that's fine. And then there's another uh, thought that the early church father named Jerome uh, interpreted, and there's some others in this school of thought, that it's epi E-N-A, which is I-E-N-A-I, and that it would be more of a future concept. So it's give us our bread for tomorrow. Give us our bread for the future or the future bread, the, the bread of the new age. So it's more of an eschatological kind of end times, new age, you know, bring in the, the new age in, in this give us our future bread concept. Not very developed there in many lines of thought. Obviously, as you know, in most English translations, it's just give us this day our daily bread. But I want to tell you that I'm a little bit more inclined to go with Origen and many of the early church fathers who looked at this nuance as give us this day the bread necessary for our existence. And I'll tell you why. Because within the context of when Jesus is teaching to the actual group of people who are sitting at his feet that he's teaching, this makes a lot of sense to me. Now, let me, let me just point something out to you. Do you remember what uh, Jesus said when he instructed his apostles and then his disciples to go into the mission field? Remember what he told them to take along? Anyone? Nothing, right? Nine, Luke 9, 3 said, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra clothes, nothing. 
So here in Luke 11, the disciples who are learning this prayer from Jesus for the first time are a group of homeless people. They have been traveling from town to town, gradually making their way to Jerusalem, and they are flat broke. They don't know where they will be spending the next night. They don't know where their next meal is going to come from. They have left their families. They have left their jobs to follow Jesus, to sit at his feet, to be his his disciples. They are as dependent upon God as one can be. And so when they ask Jesus, teach us how to pray, he says, here's how you should pray. You, my disciples who have left everything to follow me, you go to the Father and call him Papa, and you honor his name, and you ask for his kingdom to come, and then you just ask him, Papa, give us this day the bread necessary for our existence. Give us what we need to survive. And that's very much, I think, the essence of it. This is the prayer of a faith community who's left everything to follow Christ, and they are in need. They are in need of God to show up and provide what they need as this faith community to follow Christ and, and, and to advance his kingdom. They, they, they need God to show up to simply survive the day. Now, I know that most of us as American Christians, we don't, we don't think of our lives that way. We don't think of our church that way. But I will tell you that if you travel the world, and particularly in places where the church is underground, where it's under persecution, it still looks exactly like this. That people are in desperate need as the community of believers for God to show up and provide for them just basic daily needs and sustenance. And that is the context and that is how we should understand this message from its origin, from the gospel. This is how it would have been heard. Now let me point out a few things to you. Notice the first person plural that's used in this phrase. First time we've seen it in Luke's version of this prayer. Give us our daily bread, not give me. And this is significant. Jesus taught his disciples to pray together, to pray for the community of believers, not just themselves as individuals. Now, if you read Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, taught in a different situation as we talked about a couple weeks ago, you know, in that setting, Jesus says, when you pray, say, our Father. And so in both prayers is this nuance that it's not me, it's y'all, it's us, it's we. And, and that is very, very important, and it'll lead to a great deal of importance as we continue on in, in looking at this. Jesus taught them to say, you know, us, pray for us. Now, how many of us want to change that when we pray in private? Have you ever found yourself doing that? Saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to pray today and say, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us, me, my daily bread. You, you know, we're so hyper-individualistic in America that we want to take this prayer and we, want to, and we want it to be about me and I and my needs. But I want to tell you that I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can break this prayer down into some hyper-individualistic prayer just for you. I believe Jesus always assumed the body of believers, the community of believers, the fellowship of the ring, if you will. I mean, that we are together and we're following him together, and we're a community. And I think this prayer speaks to community, speaks for a community, and comes from a community. And I want you to keep that in mind. We are we. It's not just about you or just about your clan. It's about the community of faith. And it assumes that this community of faith is in need, and that we are crying out together to God to provide and to supply just for the day what we need as a community of faith. Now, where else have we seen this picture in our faith history? Where else do we remember a group of people, believers of God, who were together, who were crying out to God to provide exactly what they needed for that day, daily sustenance? You know, the first century disciples hearing Jesus teach this would go to the same place many of us do when I ask you that question, and that is back to the Israelites in the desert. Remember this story? They were liberated from Egypt. Moses is leading them out. They've been slaves, and now they're free, but they're going to a promised land, and God's going to show them where that place is. But between the place where they've been and the place where they're going, they have a very long and arduous journey, and they're going to run into really significant need, food, water, safety, all of that. And this journey has a purpose. God is going to reveal to them himself. He's going to reveal his nature, and he's going to teach them You can trust me, and only me, and I want you to be in this relationship with me. I want you to come and ask, and I will provide, and that happens a lot on this journey. 
These people suffer. They, they are going without and they are desperate because hunger and thirst create that in us. Anytime we encounter real need, it drives us to our knees. And that was the case regularly with the Israelites. And in those moments of extreme need, the Israelites were always tempted. They were always tempted to go back. Go back to the land where they were once enslaved. Go back to their former way of life. I mean, they begin to idealize, oh, it wasn't so bad. (laughs) Or they would be tempted to to turn away from the one true God and worship their pagan gods and and fertility gods and gods of the food or gods of water. Anything they could do to try to maybe please some God somewhere that would provide for them. And so this was a constant tension and temptation for the people when they were in great need. And I just want you to put yourself now in the context that we are a community of faith. We are praying as us, not I, in that we are in great need. And we are, aren't we? Maybe not physically, maybe not for hunger and food. And, and water, but there is great need within the assembly. There's great need, all of us, for God to step in and provide for us today, for all of us. That's the context. Now, let's go back to this ancient history and look at it for a minute. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Exodus 16, if you have your Bibles with you, if not, I'll throw the words up on the screen for you there, but I want you to be familiar with the fact that Jesus, whenever he preaches and teaches, he's always validating what's happened in the Old Testament. He's always validating what's come before. And so we can learn from what's happened in Exodus 16. It brings direct meaning to this prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Let's look at this together, beginning with verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. I'm just so glad I'm not Moses. You know, I mean, I get some letters, but that one's pretty, pretty intense. (laughs) All right. But the Lord hears their cries and their concerns and their genuine need, and he says to his man Moses, he says, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for it that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they follow my instructions. Now, this is the first, you know, kind of scriptural testimony we have of God providing daily bread for the community, the assembly of believers who are, who are following him to the place where he's going to lead them. And he says, I will provide, I will provide daily bread. Why? First reason why is that I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Now remember, he's leading these people into the promised land, a land he's going to give them. He's going to need them to learn, to listen to him and follow his directions, to pray and obey, to, to trust him as their father and the God that provides. So part of this necessity of why we have to eat every day, why we can't eat just once a month and be just fine, we eat every day, is that we learn dependency upon the God who provides, upon our Heavenly Father who provides. And we learn to trust Him and do what He says, right? Look further, verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites, parentheses, again, tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread, then you will know that I am the Lord your God. So here again is another reason that you know, we have this interaction of we pray and he provides. He provides this daily bread. Why? So that we will know who God is. We will know that the Lord is the Lord. And we will stop complaining against him. We'll stop going to other gods and other lords and other providers. Because of his provision, we will know that God is God and we can trust him. This is very, very significant. Jesus is teaching his disciples the very same lesson. You walk with me. You follow me. You pray this way, and you will come to to love the Father. You'll come to know the Father, that he is one that provides and delights in providing for his children. Now, because Jesus says, when you pray, say, you know, give us this day our daily bread, the bread necessary for existence, Here's a few things that we can just learn because he taught us to pray this way. Number one, we know, we can learn that the Father is capable of providing for our need. He's completely capable of that. Jesus wouldn't say, go to the Father and ask him for it if the Father was not capable of providing. Number two, the Father is willing to provide our daily bread. 
This is not something he doesn't want to do that we have to go pray and twist his arm to give us our daily bread. He is more than willing to. Number three, the father wants to be asked. I mean, think about it. When a disciple asks Jesus, teach us how to pray, and he says, when you pray, ask the father for this. What he's telling us is that the father will be honored in your asking. He is anticipating your request. You're not bothering him to ask for what you need. This is what he anticipates. He's waiting for you to, to ask. In fact, Jesus says in other places, you don't have because you don't ask. Okay, so asking is good. It's what, what, we're, what we're called to do. And number four, the Father knows what we need. He knows what the daily bread distribution should be. You don't need to tell him how that should all work out. He knows exactly what it is that you need, but he wants us to ask him to provide and and not ask someone else. Now, these are all the same kind of realities, I, I believe, that when we study Exodus 16 and, and what follows there, these are the same kind of lessons that God was trying to teach the Israelites. I, I want to provide. I will provide. I'm capable of providing. Just ask me. Don't ask them. Don't ask somebody. Just ask me, and I will delight in providing what you need, and you'll know that I'm the Lord, and we'll have a relationship. This is what Jesus is teaching us again when he says, when you pray, say, Papa, give us this day our daily bread. But the language and the way Jesus teaches this is powerful because he provides us a prayer that has the language of certainty. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that with the familiarity of this Abba, Papa, Father that he gives us as the children of God, as followers of Christ, we don't need to beg for our supper. You know, my kids come in every once in a while like, Dad, I'm starving. Right? Well, when are we going to eat? Now, are they saying, are we going to eat? Will you ever feed us? I mean, we don't know whether, Dad, you're going to show up and feed us a meal. You know, no, no, they're, they're asking. They know we're going to feed them. Why? Because I'm their dad. Chrissy's the mom. I mean, th these are our kids. Of course we're going to feed them. They're not asking if. They're asking when and what. <laughs> so this language is very intimate. It's very familial. The, the assembly of believers, the body of Christ, the, the group of those who are following Jesus can come to the Father with certainty. Say, Papa, give us this day our daily bread. You, we don't have to twist his arm. We're not begging. There's intimacy. There's a certainty there that he hears our prayer, and of course he's going to feed us. We're his children, right? Now, notice the order of this prayer. The order of the prayer is very important. Jesus never says anything that's not orderly and thoughtful in a way that, he, that you know, is <laughs> amazing to me. So the order of the prayer is you say, Father, how be thy name, thy kingdom come, and give us this day our daily bread. You see, the order is thy kingdom come first, don't miss this part. This is very, very important. And, and by the way, as, as I may have mentioned, I, I get confused what I've said, but, but what we'll see is that Jesus is going to unpack a lot of what's in this prayer. He's going to unpack in several of the different parables that come, uh, even as early as in Luke 12. He will say in Luke 12, this wonderful teaching about, do not worry about what you will eat, about what you will wear, about where you'll live, all these kind of things. But remember, seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things, food, shelter, clothing, will be provided for you because the Father knows that you need them. This is just kind of fleshing out what he taught us to pray. You go to the Father, you honor his name, you ask for his kingdom to come, and then you present your request. And all of these things will be added unto you. But seek first the kingdom of God. The order of this matters. Now, as I was studying this and preparing this message, I found, as I, you know, because I try to like hear your voice in my head when I'm preparing a message, you know, before you write me the email, the, like kind of the, I don't know about that. I don't know whether I really buy that. And is this really true? I mean, is this really an account for the way things actually are? So what is the elephant in the room about the way things actually are? Here's the elephant in the room. Is that when we look around the body of believers, we're saying, okay, God provides the daily bread for the community, but some have a whole lot more of that daily bread than others. Some seem to have an abundance of that bread and some barely have any, even enough to survive. Does the Bible account for this, this kind of unequal distribution or the unequal gathering of this daily bread that God provides for the community of faith? Yes, it does. Look at 
uh, verse, the end of verse 15, verse 16 there in Exodus 16. Moses said to them, they're, they're like, what is this stuff that's all over the camp? He says, it's the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. This is really unique passage of scripture here because they didn't often do this. But in this case, they're being obedient. They're following the instructions of the Lord. Listen, the Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some gathered little. And when they measured it by the omer, he who had gathered much did not have too much. And he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Now, did you pick up on that nuance? Daily bread, within the Old Testament picture here, was provided for the, the assembly of believers, for the community of faith, and it was kind of done and just, boom, here it is. But there were those who had the responsibility to gather much, and there were those who gathered little. What what differentiated those between, you know, those who gathered much and those who gathered litter? It was who's in your tent. Who are you responsible for? Who are you accountable for who cannot gather for themselves or cannot gather enough? So if you gathered much, it was for the purpose of distributing to those who could not gather for themselves or who could not gather enough. Those who didn't have a lot of people in their tent, did not have a large realm of responsibility, gathered little. And so when it all you know, shaked out. Everyone had enough for the day. Now, this sense of the Lord's provision for the community of faith and by distribution of those who had enough or more than enough to those who did not have enough so that everyone was satisfied, this concept is carried over into the New Testament. We see it twice in Acts 2 and then again in Acts 4 where we learn that the early church sold their possessions and goods and gave to anyone as he had need. We see that in Acts 2 and then Acts 4, so that there were no needy persons among them. This concept of the community of faith receiving exactly what is necessary from the Father to the assembly of believers presumes also that those who have gathered much will share, will distribute to those who could not gather for themselves or could not gather enough so that everyone has enough. Jesus is going to unpack this further. I'll just tease you with this. Luke 12, 41 through 48, a very powerful parable of the faithful and unfaithful servant. In this passage, if you want to skip ahead and look at that, uh, maybe this week in your own Bible study, Jesus talks about those who are tasked to be managers. They are those who are entrusted with much, and their role is to distribute the surplus to the servants of the master. If they are faithful with the distribution so that all the servants are fed, then they are entrusted with more. If they hoard up what they had, they claimed it as their own, and they failed to distribute it, they were severely punished. Jesus concludes the parable with this very famous statement that we've heard many times in verse 48. From everyone whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. This accounts for the way we see things within the body of Christ, within the assembly of believers. There are those who've been given much. There have been those who've been entrusted with more. And we're not just talking about money. We're just talking about all the, the, the daily sustenance that God gives us, whatever that might be. But the scripture will tell us there's a responsibility to, distri to, to dis distribute <laughs> that to those who cannot gather or cannot gather enough. Now, this... Uh, concept of the daily bread also has a, a potential dark side to it, and that is that um, every once in a while, people will be inclined to hoard away or store up God's provision, and that is unfaithful and greedy, and there's a lot in the Bible that speaks against that. Look at uh, verse 19 there in Exodus 16, 19. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, you know, but it was full of maggots and began to smell, and so Moses was angry with them. Now, this is not largely developed here, but it will be more and more largely developed, and that is just the fact that God provides just enough for the community of faith every day. And if everyone is just in the way it's distributed, there'll be enough for everybody. But we cannot fall into this sin that enters the camp in the form of greed. According to the scripture we just read, when people within the faith community attempted to hoard away extra portions of God's daily bread for their future, their disobedience became rotten and it just stunk up the whole camp. 
Jesus will unpack this theme further in Luke 12, verses 13 through 21, in the parable of the rich fool, which is a story about a wealthy man who had a great, huge harvest, and he's thinking, wow, you know, he's not thinking to himself, share with the community, he's thinking to himself, I need a bigger barn. I need a bigger barn so I can store all of my wealth, and then I can just live high in the hog. And then what happens? God takes his soul that very night, and his wealth and all of his abundance is wasted. It's a very strong parable. We'll get to that. But this concept of the daily bread for the community that is to be shared, to be distributed, and it is not to be hoarded up is something that's there. It's in the Old Testament, and it's going to hit us really right between the eyes as we continue on through Luke. So here's just some of the things that we've covered this far, just kind of summing up uh, on this, because we've said a lot. I've said a lot. And that is that the Papa Father delights in providing. He's not offended when we ask, and he knows what we need, and he wants us to ask. And we shall receive. Ask and we shall receive. Jesus talks about that. God is faithful to provide exactly what we need for today as the community of faith. And some of us will gather much. Some of us will gather little. But because this prayer and this promise is for we and not me, we never think of God's you know, provision of daily bread as just my own life. It's always within the context of the faith community, of us on this journey together, of us having responsibility for one another. And we must resist, um, you know, greed. And finally, I want to come back to the one thing that I said earlier, and that is that there's an order to this. You know, a lot of us walk around and we have a sense of entitlement about what God owes us. You know, God, where's my daily bread? You said you give me daily bread, and I'm, I'm a Christian well, but have you prayed, thy kingdom come? Have you submitted your heart and your life and your agenda to his kingdom? Because this is said over and over again. That comes first. Show me your allegiance. Repent. Confess your sin. Call upon my kingdom to come and be made manifest, and then I will provide. If you think that God's going to provide and supply your kingdom agenda without yielding to his first. I think this is where the disconnect happens for a lot of Christians. So keep that in mind. It's in the prayer. It's written in there within the the order of things, and Jesus will unpack it later for us in Luke 12. Finally, you know, because the word daily is in there, give us daily the bread that we need for our existence, the concept here is that we're going to pray this prayer every single day, that we're going to get on our knees every single morning. We're going to ask the Father to supply What we need are you, me, my family, your family, and all of us as the family of Christ. We have to ask every day. And you're thinking, well, why do we need to do it every day? Why can't I pray once a week? Why can't I pray once, you know, when I'm feeling religious, Christmas Eve or Easter or whatever? I mean, why why do I have to pray all the time? And I would ask you the question, well, why do you think you have to eat all the time? You know, can you eat once a month? Can you eat once, you know, once or twice every year and that satisfies you? No. And it's really amazing when we talk about the Lord's Supper, it's as often as you do this, which is pretty often, we eat, we ask, we thank God, we honor his name, we seek his kingdom first. Why? Well, you know what? Because you won't know your father if you don't talk to him. You won't seek your father if you don't need him. You won't love your father if you're unaware of his generous provision. And we won't care for our brothers and sisters if we don't learn how to share This prayer is brilliant. It is teaching us how to pray as a family, as a community who's in relationship with their father. So this is how children of God, followers of Jesus Christ, pray. And let's say it together. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. Lord, this is our prayer, the community of faith. And we we come thinking of all of the people that we know within our faith community. Those who have much, those who have little, those who have been going without. We say thank you for providing just exactly what we need so that everyone within the community can have enough for this day. I pray that we'll be faithful with that which you've entrusted to us. I pray that we will not be led into the temptation of greed or self-justification, but that we'll humble ourselves, seek your kingdom, and follow your instructions, that we will be a people that believe that you are the Lord. We don't need another Lord. We don't need to be a Lord. 
We can rest in your home, in your kingdom, trusting that you are a father who loves us, who delights in providing, who anticipates our request. Lord, increase our faith even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.